Hello everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel. This video is about flying cross country in what's called a PW5 glider. So be sure and look us up. Look up Texas Soaring Association for more information. Now this is the PW5 and it's considered low performance. The glider's empty weight is about 400 pounds with a maximum gross weight of about 660 pounds. The wingspan is 44 feet and has a glide ratio of 32 to 1, which simply means if the glider was at 5,000 feet, you could technically glide 32 miles. But we don't actually use that number when flying. We use a much more conservative number. A conservative number would be 1,000 feet of altitude, you could glide 3 miles. And that's good for your first cross-country training work. The stall speed is about 35 miles per hour, and I typically fly the PW between, say, 40 and 70 miles per hour. That's real typical in a cross-country flight. What a glider cross-country flight means to me is simply flying outside the gliding distance of your home base. So here's the flight, and let's take a look at it. The red circle at the top is TSA, and that's where I started out from. From there, I'm going to head west over to Lupscombe, which is about seven miles. Next, I headed south, going to Hillsboro, and that's about 20 miles in a straight line. So from Hillsboro, shown at the bottom red circle, we're going to head northeast, and that's going to be about 18 miles as the crow flies. Next, I'm going to turn north and head uh, toward Wachahatchee, and that's about seven or eight miles. From Wachahatchee, I'll head due west back to TSA. And this is a good basic cross-country flight. Now in this image, I want to show you some really cool effects. I'm using a GPS data logger and adding it to this video to give all of these flight information in real time. So let's take a look. Starting on the bottom left-hand corner, that's ground speed, not air speed, so don't get that confused. The GPS can only calculate ground speed. Top left is the actual flight, and that is to scale. And you'll notice that little red triangle. That's, that'll be the glider as we fly. Top center is the compass heading. At the right will be the flight time. Further to the right-hand corner is your rate of climb indicator as measured in feet per minute. On the bottom right hand corner, that's your altimeter as measured above sea level. An easy way to figure out how far we are above the ground is simply subtract about 600 feet from the number you see on the screen and that will get you altitude above the ground. Okay, coming up is the flight. We're getting ready to take off. Here we go. During the tow, we're going to be very focused. We're going to keep our eyes on that tow plane at all times. You cannot allow distractions to get in the way. If you do, you may even lose sight of the tow plane, and that can really cause serious problems. And here are the numbers we like to use when towing. At or below 200, land straight ahead, either a little to the right or to the left. At altitudes above 200 feet and to 600 feet, you can land downwind. Above 600 feet above the ground, you could do an abbreviated pattern. And these numbers vary from instructor to instructor, but they're conservative and they'll keep you safe. At this point, I'm high enough. I'm going to pull the release. I've cleared the area. I'm going to make a right hand ascending turn while the tow plane makes a left descending turn so we can separate as fast as possible. It was a great day to fly. Look at those beautiful cumulus clouds. We as glider pilots love cumulus clouds. They can help guide us to the thermals as we go cross country. So after release, I'm going to stay within gliding range of uh, our base, TSA. But you'll see the altimeter. I've already lost about half my altitude and I'm just about a point to saying it's time to set up for an approach for landing. But I'm going to sit around here and struggle with it, not give up. I've got a landing area right below me. It's no big deal. Typically the first 15 to 20 minutes, I'll just stay in the 
within gliding range of TSA and, and see what I can do initially. And that's kind of what I'm working at right now, just to gain the altitude to start on my cross country. Something of interest is, typically I don't have a planned cross country flight. I'm going to talk to the other pilots, we're going to look at the weather, we're going to consider different things, and once I decide to go a direction, I'll just keep going until I figure out how to get back to base. <laughs> okay, I'm looking good. I'm climbing above 3,500. So on this cross country, I do have a number of land out areas. And these would be grass strips or airports that I could land at. They're kind of all the way around my flight. In the beginning of your cross country flying, I can tell you there can be a lot of fear about landing out. But there's training for that. We learn how to land out safely. You know, below me, there's 50,000 places to land. Really, there are. But it would be nice to land a grass strip so I could get an arrow tow. And that's a luxury you don't see very often. Boy, I'll tell you, this thermal really blossomed out as I gained altitude. Looks like I'm now over 5,000 feet. And that definitely gets you a warm, fuzzy feeling when you start heading out to your first waypoint. Where TSA is located, the Glider Club, we've got thousands of land out areas. We're very fortunate to have that. Probably at some glider clubs, may not have all the luxuries that we have here. Real nice thermal. Got me up to over 6,000 feet, so I'm headed out toward Lovescombe. I don't actually make it all the way there, and I decided to turn south and head toward Hillsboro, but that's just the way it turned out. And it turned out to be a great flight anyway. Now this will be my third year flying gliders. I do have a private pilot with this glider add-on. People ask me, what is a glider license? And I'll tell you friends, it's a license to learn. And that's the main thing you'll learn when you're flying cross country and doing all your training anyway. So far in flying three years, I've had three land outs. Two were at Embry, and the other one was at Dragon Tail. Fortunately, and the luxury was getting a arrow tow out. But if you land in a field somewhere, we can't get you a tow out of there. You're going to have to get a trailer and go from there. You'll notice the red triangle there on the far left corner is now moving towards Hillsboro. And that's about a 20 mile distance and typically since we'll be flying in a headwind it's could take two or three or four thermals to get there and one of the techniques I'm using is porpoising or dolphin which simply means when I get into the lift I'm going to slow down when I get in sync I want to speed up and if I get in heavy sync I want to speed up even faster you want to get away from that down air as soon as possible and another benefit of dolphin or porpoising is you'll have a faster overall ground speed during your flight. And that will really help your speed. If you circle a lot, your ground speed is going to be a lot slower. And when I was first learning, my ground speed would be averaging between 15 and 30 miles per hour. So once I learned that technique, you can certainly fly faster around the course my average ground speed using this technique has, has got me up to about 40 miles per hour. When we fly cross country, part of your training will be obviously how to land out. So when you get about 3,000 feet above the ground, you want a general landing area. At 2,000 feet, you want a Pacific landing area. And at 1,500 feet, you might have an optional landing area close by. When you fly cross country, sooner or later you are going to land out. If you're not, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> so when you do get low, you want to focus on any available lift, even if it's zero sync. You, if you're low, you just don't go off and fly somewhere else because you just don't have the time. But if you can stay in that zero sync, it could develop into to a really nice thermal and get you out of there. And I've done that, and we've all done that if you've had enough flying time. Okay, look at the triangle, red triangle. It looks like I've made it over Hillsboro. 
with altitude to spare. I'm going to work this thermal and climb on out and then head head uh, north, uh, what is that, northeast, up to George Shanks' house. From Hillsboro, I'll be flying up to George Shanks' house and that'll be basically 18 miles headed uh, northeast. And I'll have a little bit of a tailwind to kind of help me on my ground speed. Flying at TSA, flying gliders, is typically an afternoon sport. At least it is for us. We usually wait until maybe noon and go till 6 p.m. Well, we got to get that air warm enough to start creating these thermals. So as I fly this direction, I'm at about 4,500 feet. And if I find another thermal, I'm going to use it just to give me that extra margin of error in case I uh, don't find any more additional thermals. You'll notice on the upper left hand corner the triangle is getting closer to my next waypoint. So at this point I have probably about eight or nine miles to go. And one of the reasons I'm using that for a waypoint is it's a great place to land. It's a really nice grass strip, well, well taken care of. And if you do land there, you could get an arrow tow out. So that's another good reason to use uh, waypoints for these grass strips as part of your flight. Okay, from this altitude, I have sufficient altitude to make it to, to the grass strip over at Shanks' property. Now that I'm below 3,000 feet, I'm just going to continue to head directly to the airport and if in the meantime I find some lift I'll circle in it. So I have confidence in knowing that I'll make it to the to the grass strip but you know I'm thinking come on I just need one more thermal here. Please somebody find me a thermal. I don't want to land out here. Anyway that's my thought as I'm going but I'm relaxed there's no problem because I got that airport right there in front of me. Not an issue. When flying and getting low, you don't just give up. I'm going to work any available lift that I can find. And again, like I said, even zero sink, hey, I'll be happy with that. Hopefully that would generate in something better. Now that I'm over Shanks, I'm starting to circle above the airport. And I've started to find some lift here that I'm going to work. So I'm thinking, come on thermal, just this one more. All I need is this one more good thermal and I can make it home. Please help me. I promise never to do anything bad again in my life. <laughs> so I kept working this thermal and I'll make minor adjustments to try to find the center of it. You may not find it in your first 360 and it just takes practice to continue searching it, finding that core and trying to stay in it the best you can. And of course the lower you are, the harder it is to stay in a, in a thermal. As you get higher, hopefully sometimes they can blossom out and you can reduce your bank angle. But it all depends. Every, every thermal is different and every day is different. No two, there's none the same, that's for sure. Okay, at this point I'm feeling really good. Now that I've climbed up over 3,000 feet, notice that little red triangle on the upper left hand corner on the yellow line. That's my approximate location, which is in the scale to this flight. So I'm working my way back home, but I'm not going to go directly toward it. I'm going to work my way toward Wachahatchee, which is basically north, and then make a left turn headed uh, west back to TSA. And as I talked before, you know, there's some of us that will just simply stay within gliding range of their airport. And for some people, that's fine if that's what they want to do. Obviously, the next challenge is, is to fly, get away from gliding range of your airport, day thermal. followed by starting your cross-country flights. And then, as you gain more so experience, nice even flying feeling, faster on those cross-country flights. <laughs> 
Now, isn't this amazing? I started out Looks less than 2,000 feet, and now I'm back up to over 6,000 feet. Just an amazing experience. And one of the neat things is, you know, every flight is different. I don't actually have a flight plan. When I wake up in the morning, it's going to vary a lot. And we're going to look at weather. We're going to talk to some of our other glider pilots. We're going to look at the clouds, the temperature. And typically, we don't fly until earliest would be about 12 o'clock Central Standard Time. The PW is considered a low performance glider. When I'm flying cross country, if I can get between an average speed of 40 to 45 miles an hour, that would be exceptional. But typically it's closer to about 30 miles an hour average ground speed over the course. And our air speeds are typically 50 to 60 miles per hour. Minimum sink speeds around 37, 38 miles an hour. So at the end of the day, I've got that warm, fuzzy feeling. <laughs> I'm at 6,500 and I have it made to the shade getting home. I don't need any additional thermals, so I'm going to just add up a few more points on, on the OLC contest board and get ready to set it up for a landing here in just a few minutes. And as glider pilots, we like to see cumulus clouds. That can guide us as to where the lift is. If there is no cumulus cloud, we call it a blue day, there just could be as many thermals, but you can't, you don't have any way to guide for it like you can seeing the real thing. All right, let's get ready to set it up for landing. Here I am at about uh, 1,600 feet on a, a base two final for runway 36 at TSA. All right, let's just watch the landing. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. And be sure and look up all my other gliding videos, including ultralights, radio control, and a lot more. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye.